Just weekend warrior heights, out walking, just moving their body. Kind of thing. Yeah, the, the word athlete I think sometimes gets people. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll tell people all the time, you know, if, if you're out working in your garden, you need to take care of your body like you're an athlete. If you want to continue to do and perform the things that you want to do in life. Um, so I'm glad that you're here to continue to do that better, whatever it is that um, you enjoy doing. Uh, so I am a physical therapist originally, but I'm also a certified nutrition specialist, and that's kind of the road we're going to go down for today. Um, we're going to talk about inflammation and nutrition. So um, I'm going to ask you a true or false. As an athlete or an active person, I can eat whatever I want to replenish the calories that I burn during my exercise. I tell myself that. You can. Um, yeah. You can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So you're right. It's it's false. We could eat whatever we wanted and make whatever choices because maybe we think a calorie is a calorie. But the, the fact is that what we put in our body either increases inflammation or decreases inflammation. There's very few things that we put into our body, whether it's a food, whether it's a beverage, whether it's a supplement, that is neutral. Almost everything is either increasing our inflammation or decreasing the inflammation that we have in our body. So how many of you have experienced inflammation? Everybody? Okay. It should be everybody because if you've ever had a paper cut, you've seen inflammation. So when you get a paper cut and it gets red and sore, like it gets so much redder than you would expect a little paper cut to, to get, right? And that is inflammation. That is your body's responding to tissue damage. Um, and it's absolutely normal. So inflammation is a normal part of life. It's how our body responds to any type of damage. And um, it often occurs in athletes when we push ourselves a little harder, when we maybe start a new training program that maybe our body's not used to, or when, um, or race day. Race day often push ourselves, maybe um, adrenaline or motivation or ego pushes us a little bit further in our bodies than maybe we're used to, and our body responds to inflammation. And we want our body to respond to infl with inflammation because that's how our body heals. So any damage that's occurred in our body during that activity is repaired through inflammation by the nutrients rushing to the area, fixing everything up. The problem is we want the inflammation to rush there and when it's done its work to get out. The problem is for various reasons, sometimes inflammation sticks around. Uh, some of those reasons are um, injury, like a persistent injury that we're not taking care of. Sometimes it's because of um, lack of sleep or extra stress so we're not letting our body uh, recover because sleep is usually when our body does that or because of um, nutritional deficiencies that we aren't helping our body recover the way it needs to. So who cares if the inflammation sticks around? Why does it even matter? So short term, that extra inflammation that stays around longer than it should can lead to poor performance, uh, aches and pains, hormone dysregulation. Uh, it can often result in weight gain because inflammation is often stored when it sticks around in our fat cells, which then makes them bigger than maybe we want them to be. Um, and then long term, that can result in cardiovascular disease, diabetes, autoimmune disease, various skin issues. So long term, that inflammation sticking around can be a much bigger issue when it comes to our long term. And I don't know about you, but there was a time in my life when I wasn't so concerned about the decades from now, but I'm at a point in my life now after 40 where it really matters to me how my body is going to feel and perform in my 50s, in my 60s, in my 70s. Um, one of my main goals in the exercise that I do is I want to be 90 years old, I want to get on an airplane, and when that gentleman says, oh, can I put that in the overhead compartment for you, I want to say no thank you and toss my luggage at myself. Like, that's like my, my fitness goal <laughs> for my life. Uh, so I cannot do that if I have inflammation in my body, inflammation that's causing aches and pains, inflammation that's causing extra weight for me to carry around, or inflammation that's causing me to be diabetic or have heart disease or any of those various things. 
So we want the inflammation to come, but then we want it to get out of there. Right? So easy solution will be out of here in 30 seconds. We take NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They decrease pain, they decrease inflammation, they get that inflammation out of there, we're done, we're happy, we move on. We could, right? There's a place for NSAIDs. Um, I've taken them, you know, after surgeries or after procedures or after, you know, serious injuries that I needed pain relief to, you know, move on. But the fact is, when we're constantly putting the NSAIDs in, the ibuprofen, um, the Advil, the Aleve, the anti-inflammatories, what we're causing is gut damage, which causes more inflammation. Um, it impairs our body's ability to do the repair that it needs to. So when after an injury we take NSAIDs, it's actually going to be slower for our tissues to, let's say we've torn something, it's going to be longer for our body to regrow and repair those tissues um, when we're taking too many of those anti-inflammatories. Um, so performance, gut health, or something else. Or something else that I was... Mm. No, I have this, I'm not look at it. Anyway, so there's better options in order to get rid of our inflammation other than constantly popping a pill for a quick fix. Now, absolutely there are times when that's appropriate and there are times when that's needed. As physical therapists, there are times that people need to take that in order to survive their hour session with us, and that's okay, right? But um, we don't want to immediately, after we work out or after we go for a run or after we perform a race, immediately our go-to is just to be put those medications in our body that's going to keep us from repairing the way that we need to, being able to perform the next day the way that we need to, um, and long term, we're just increasing inflammation because we're damaging our gut health. Um, so it was interesting when I actually haven't talked a whole lot about inflammation specifically to endurance athletes, because we talk a lot more about inflammation when it comes to um, the resistance training athlete. So the CrossFitters, the people who are lifting heavy weights, because it's often much more obvious to them that they're inflamed. Um, you know, when you um, when you work out, you know, when you do a whole lot of bicep curls, you can walk out of the gym with a bigger bicep than you came in, and really that's inflammation. That's fluids filling up the muscle, um, and it's more obvious in those senses that there's inflammation. It's obvious sometimes with um, the discomfort that they have that there's been damage to the muscle and their tissues that, that are inflamed. Sometimes endurance athletes, it doesn't seem as obvious, right? But the reality is it can almost be a bigger deal for the endurance athlete because what you need as an endurance athlete is you need to be really good at getting oxygen to your muscles for your muscles to use that oxygen over and over and over again over a long period of time. What happens is when our body uses up that, muscles use up that oxygen, it releases oxidative stress and free radicals. Those free radicals then lead to inflammation. And again, that inflammation is fine as long as it gets out. But what happens when it does it? It stays in and causes trouble. Um, has anyone had the experience or had a friend have the experience to have a lot of um, upper respiratory infections or trouble after they have a race? You know, they, they have a big race, marathon, um, big triathlete, some, triathlon or something, and it's real common that athletes will get just the stuffy nose, the sinus stuff, sometimes they're, you know, in bed for 24 hours with this kind of just stuff in their head. And it used to be thought that just when you wear your body down, maybe we're, we're more prone to infection. But only about 5% of those um, situations of the upper respiratory symptoms are a result of infection, 5%. Um, about 50% about of those are due to known or unknown asthma or allergies. And 40% of those cases are due to just inflammation. So inflammation in the body. So inflammation doesn't necessarily stay where it happened. So if you think you're running a marathon 
your legs are what's inflamed, right? Your legs is where you feel that lactic acid and you feel that burn and you feel that inflammation. But it doesn't necessarily stay there. Um, it can go hang out in your digestive system and cause trouble there. Um, inflammation um, in the cardiovascular system is high blood pressure, heart disease. Inflammation can hang out in the brain and cause brain fog, fatigue, um, uh, eventually dementia. But even just that kind of foggy feeling in the head can be inflammation that maybe started in the muscle, but when it's hanging around, it kind of just spreads out all over the body and we can feel it in different places. Um, so, with that being said, what do we do about inflammation if we're not just going to pop, pop some pills to get rid of it? Because we know that's not a good long-term solution. Um, first of all, if we have any injuries, anything nagging, anything frustrated, frustrating, we need to take care of it. So don't wait till it gets so bad. Um, little aches and pains and nagging things we need to take care of, we need to foam roll them, we need to stretch them out, we need to, I would highly recommend physical therapy, you know, there's really good people to see, um, my favorite one's right back there, um, and that's, that's a great way, if you get rid of the problem, you get rid of kind of that stressor on the body, you're not going to have as much inflammation. Um, the other thing is to really take care of your stress and your sleep. Uh, it's important that it's not as much the hours of sleep, so it's not I went to bed at 10 o'clock and I stayed there till 6 and that's 8 hours of sleep. You really want to work on strategies to improve your deep sleep because that's when your body really does the repair work that it needs to really get rid of inflammation, especially if it's been there a long time and it's been kind of packed away um, in fat cells or in the brain or in the digestive system. It's in that deep sleep that you only get to after an extended period of time. Um, most of that work happens between the hours of 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. for most of us. So if we're staying up, let's say, to 1 o'clock in the morning, but we're still getting eight hours of sleep, we're really missing out on the prime time of inflammation fighting, repair, the, the good stuff that our body wants to do. Most of that's happening for most of us, the average person, kind of between those hours. Not that you got, I mean, I, we're not in bed every night at 10 o'clock, but we try to make the most of those, of those hours. Uh, especially if you're in a season of heavy training or in a season of lots of races and activity, um, it's just more important to step it up there. And then finally, uh, what we came to talk about nutrition, what we're putting in our body makes a big difference into whether we are fighting to get rid of inflammation or we're adding more inflammation to our body, okay? So first of all, what people often ask me when, you know, we talk about nutrition is, but how stringent do I need to be? Um, because we're going to talk about some things that it's best to avoid, things that we need, maybe need to decrease, things that we should increase, um, and people are like, well, how much, you know, how, how much do I need to follow that? And to be honest, it depends. So it depends on what other stressors you have in your life. If you're going through a season where you know just life in general is super, super stressful, then you need to kind of rein it in a little bit tighter um, with your nutrition in order for your body to be able to handle that stress and training and you know all, all the things that you have on our plate because none of us just have you know one thing, right? So uh, the other stressors. Um, your training schedule, so if you're in a season of really heavy training or really frequent um, races or times where you're really trying to perform well, those are times when you need to rein it in a little bit more. When you're in a season where you're not training quite as hard, you can get away with a little bit more. And then lastly, um, inflammation, how much our body responds to inflammation, how much inflammation we tend to have is very genetically based. So, um, you know, based on your genetics, whether you respond, uh, you know, favorably or unfavorably to certain things um, in regards to inflammation. So for me, I am very, very prone to inflammation and I can feel it. Um, you know, I know if I eat certain things that are inflammatory to me, I wake up and I can't get my wedding ring off um, because my body, my joints, my body's inflamed. And other people are more resilient and they're able to, you know, get away with a little bit more than I might be able to. 
in that regard. So let's get to kind of this list of some things we need to think about when it comes to bringing our inflammation down as much as we can. So the first one, you've heard it before, decrease sugars and artificial sweeteners. So sugar is very inflammatory. It causes a spike in our blood sugar, a spike in our insulin, which then causes inflammation to rush into the body because that's not good for us. It needs to, you know, too much uh, sugar in our bloodstream would kill us. So we need to take care of that, right? So artificial sweeteners for a lot of people are the exact same way. So for many people, artificial sweeteners are just as or more in inflammatory than regular sugars. So artificial sweeteners are gonna be things like your aspartame, uh, your sucralose, safe sweeteners, the natural sweeteners. Most people do fine with stevias, with monk fruit. Um, the sugar alcohols like erythritol give some people digestive trouble but don't usually cause the inflammation that the other artificial sweeteners do. Um, but remember, sugar is not just sugar like we would find in cakes and cookies. Sugar is also what um, our white breads, white pastas, crackers, those sort of things turn into when they go, you know, go into our body. So it's not about never having, you know, being on a completely sugar-free, sugar-eliminated diet. Um, it's a matter of dialing those things down. Um, especially in times when you need it more. Um, and in that same sense with the artificial sweeteners, avoiding artificial colors and flavors. Um, unfortunately, a lot of time, a lot of our sports-related beverages and goos and um, supplement things that we drink pre or post-workout, um, a lot of them have artificial colors, flavors, preservatives. Um, and the artificial sweeteners in them um, to make them pretty and fun and taste good. Unfortunately, that's gonna be inflammatory to the body because our body can't recognize that. It's artificial, it's fake. When it goes into our body, our body says, I don't know what that is or what to do with it. So we better, you know, we better uh, grab a hold of it and get it out of here. And it does that through inflammation. There are options that are not inflammatory. So don't think like, oh, I just can't have any of those things. There are options that don't have those things. You, you just have to read the labels. You gotta turn stuff over and see what the ingredients are to know. What do we wanna increase? We wanna increase primarily our healthy omega-3 fats. So um, these are things like olive oil, avocado, nuts, seeds, fish, um, fish oil supplements. The omega-3s um, are found to be um, and the research is with arthritis, but I would say we could, we could assume that it would be in other cases too, that uh, omega-3 fish oil supplements are, can be as effective in decreasing pain and inflammation in joints with people with arthritis as ibuprofen. So the NSAIDs that we just talked about being harmful, the omega-3 um, fatty acids have found to be as beneficial in decreasing pain and inflammation. Like I said, that research is specifically with arthritis, but I would say we could, we could assume it would be helpful to the rest of us that aren't, don't have arthritis yet I, as well. Um, as we increase our omega-3 fats, we want to decrease our omega-6 fats. And this is a really important one. This would maybe, maybe should have even been top on my list because probably one of the most inflammatory things that we put in our body, and most of us do it every single day, are omega-6 fats. So these are our vegetable oils, uh, canola, soy, safflower, uh, peanut oil. And you would be really, really surprised the things that these oils are in. Um, for many of us, um, we've started cooking with, you know, we're aware, we've started cooking with things like olive oil or avocado oil. Uh, coconut oil is a good option. Uh, but you would be surprised if you eat any packaged foods, um, if you turn over and look at the label, pasta sauces, salad dressings, um, saltine crackers have canola oil in them. Um, you know, it's really surprising the way that those omega-6 fats hang around. The reason why I feel like this maybe should have been number one is because the first one was decreased sugar. Well, sugar pretty much clears from our body in 12 to 24 hours, as long as we're a healthy, normal person, right? The omega-6 fats, how long do you think they hang around? Once. Once. 
months? Two years. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so that, that, that uh, saltine cracker you had two years ago with the canola oil, some of that canola oil still could be hanging around um, a long time. So for me, that kind of, you know, if, if I decide to have cookies today, at least my body's over it tomorrow, right? But these omega-6 fats are staying around in our body and continuing to cause trouble for a long time. So getting those out as much as we can is going to be beneficial. What do we need to have more of? Uh, fresh produce. So especially things like uh, berries, dark leafy green vegetables. Um, those are big ones because they're antioxidants, and antioxidants help support our body in getting rid of inflammation. Um, the other big one is cruciferous vegetables. So those are going to be things like your cabbage, your broccoli, your cauliflower. Those are really important because they help your, your liver detoxify. And part of the way our body uh, gets rid of inflammation is by moving toxins through the liver. And when we can support our body um, with that, we'll be able to get rid of more inflammation. Some of us are better at detoxifying than others um, and need to focus more on that. Um, personally, in our family, we are all bad detoxifiers genetically. Uh, we don't detoxify well and we have to support, Trevor's looking at me, all the crazy things I'm making do. Um, we have to support our body in getting rid of toxins. So if we have the red number 17 and preservative whatever and, um, you know, pesticide, vegetables, and all these things. Like, we have to work at helping our body detoxify. Some people don't. Some people, their body detoxifies really well. They do it automatically. That's how our body's supposed to do it. Um, some of us, genetically, we need a little bit more help. Um, and actually, a large part of the population at this point um, isn't a good detoxifier. And that's related to the MTHFR gene, if you're familiar with that. Um, this one, don't, don't throw anything at me. Limiting alcohol, <laughs> right? Um, you know, all of them, even the wine, even the red wine, it's, it's healthy, right? And again, this isn't a matter of never having a drink with alcohol. It's a matter of choosing to do that when you know your body can handle it. So I'm really not a fan of like at the end of the race going to the beer tent. I kind of feel like that's not the best idea. I feel like we should make another stop first where we fill our body up with all these other things that we need to refuel and recover, and then let's have a beer. But the head's like right there. I know, I know, I know. I know. Um, anyway, so that's just, that's just gonna increase the inflammation in the body. Again, it's not a matter of never having a drink. It's a matter of if you're in a season where you're not sleeping, where you're stressed out at work, and you're training like crazy, you might want to drink, but it's probably not going to, you know, be the, be the best idea. When you're on vacation and you're relaxed and you, you know, you're fitting in that training session, you know, on the beach and, you know, you're pretty otherwise relaxed and things are, things are good in your world, then enjoy the drink. Have it. Um, but just know if all the other things are piled up, that you know that glass of wine on top of top of the big pile of stress is actually going to cause more harm than it is good. Probiotic and prebiotic rich foods. So this is back to the idea of your gut health being related, related to inflammation, and a lot of inflammation throughout the body is driven from the digestive system. And I mean, if you think about it, the, you know, food goes into our, our digestive system and then is sent to all the other places of our body, right? Uh, to function and do the things that they need to do. So if we have inflammation in the gut, it's just going to go to all the places. Um, this is especially important if you have any digestive trouble. So if you have bloating, constipation, diarrhea, um, if you have any um, food intolerances, uh, if you're familiar, familiar with the term leaky gut, when you know your the lining of your digestive system kind of kind of instead of being real tight, kind of comes open and things that aren't supposed to sneak through, that causes a lot of inflammation. So just in general, all of us who want to generally be healthy need to take good care of our digestive system. And we can do that through foods that are high in probiotics. So those are going to be the things with our healthy gut bugs, the things you think of like sauerkraut, kimchi, yogurt. Um, and prebiotic fiber is the what feeds those probiotics. Um, that's going to be onion, garlic, asparagus, 
artichokes, those kind of um, vegetables are really good. Uh, prebiotic fiber, oh, a yummier one, apple peel. So the peel of the apple, don't peel your apple and just eat the inside. The outside is high in um, prebiotic fibers. That's a yummier one than the artichokes and the garlic, right? <laughs> Um, and those also, you can also supplement with those things. If you feel like you can't get enough in your diet, there, there are ways that you can supplement with those. Um, eating enough calories to support your training, and for most people, what they're missing is protein. Some people feel like, um, there has been some research in the past about protein causing more inflammation, uh, but if you read those studies carefully, it's the protein that they choose to use. So things uh, that are highly processed, Things like hot dogs and sausages and bacon, and those things do tend to be more inflammatory. Um, but the other proteins, the, the other, um, you know, our chickens, our fish, um, our beans, uh, our, you know, other protein sources that aren't as processed are anti-inflammatory. And the reason being, um, is that we need enough of the protein and the nutrients that our body needs to do our everyday life, to be able to train the way that we want to, to be able to recover. And it needs those resources to have the energy to do it. So it takes our body a lot of energy to recover from just the way we kind of beat up on it every day. And if we're not giving ourselves what we need, I often find um, most of, especially the women I work with, men not so much, but something about something about women. Um, most of the women that I work with, we need to increase their calories in order to get them to a healthier place. We often need to increase their calories in order to allow them to lose weight because their body just isn't able to do the functions that it needs to do with what they're giving it. Usually, the missing piece is protein. Um, Sometimes it's carbs or fats if they decided to like completely eliminate a food group for some reason. Um, but just getting enough of what your body needs is really important. And then the last one is supplementing to fill in nutritional gaps. So most of these other things, you know, we talked a little bit about maybe fish oils or probiotics. Um, and even supplementing with protein. So if you use like a collagen powder, that's a supplement. I don't, that's, I don't consider that a real food source. I consider that a supplement. So supplement to fill in the nutritional gaps. Um, our food, our nutrition, should always be primary and the basis of how we fuel our body. Um, supplements come in to fill the gaps. So when there are places that we can't get enough of something, um, that's when supplements come in to fill in and maybe to give us a boost. Because the reality is when we're training hard, when we're working our bodies, when we're pushing ourselves to the next level, or you know, with a goal where we want to be, um, we're depleting our body of more nutrients than we would if we were sitting on the couch watching Netflix. Therefore, we need more of those nutrients, and it might just be a reality that some of those, we can't just eat enough food to get. I mean, you really can only put in so much food in a day. And there's some, I mean, to be very honest, I mean, I try to eat healthy, but there's some foods that I'm just not gonna eat. I mean, I'm not a sauerkraut eater. I'll eat some yogurt, but I'm not a sauerkraut and kimchi eater. I'm not gonna get as much probiotics as my body needs right, right now for me personally without supplementing with that stuff. Um, for me personally, protein's one. I'm not a big fan of it, especially in the morning. Um, I'm, I'm in a hurry, so oftentimes supplementing with protein is something that I need to do to hit my mark. I would love to be able to do it with, with just food, but it doesn't always happen. But again, the supplements always need to be the little extra to fill in the gap. So if you're talking about getting dressed in the morning, you put all of your clothes on first, and ladies, then we put on our jewelry, right? You would not just put on your jewelry and walk out of the house. That would be a bad idea, right? So that's what I consider. When you're just taking the supplements and not you know, paying any attention to what you eat, um, the supplements aren't going to do it. The supplements aren't going to make you healthy. The food is going to help support your health, and the supplements are going to support the food that you eat. Um, so you know, eating enough calories, getting all the nutrients that we need. Um, the, the magic question is, so you know, what, what is ideal? There is no one size fits all. I wish there was. I wish I could come and be like, this is what we all should eat 
that would be super easy, right? But it's not. We are all different. Um, our bodies, we have um, different genetics, we have different medical histories, uh, we have different goals for our body, different things that we want our body to show up and perform. I mean, my husband and I live fairly um, similar lifestyles, but we eat completely different because this body right here has birthed two children and that one has not. <laughs> um, that body's a whole, over a year older than this one. So, you know, there are things that his body needs extra help. Um, he's a male and I'm a female, there's, you know, obvious things too. But we eat very, very differently to support our bodies. Um, we have different goals for um, what we want our bodies to do, do for us, um, and that's seen in our nutrition. So, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, my information to contact me, I believe I put on the bottom there. Um, like I said, we are physical therapists, I'm a nutrition specialist, I do health coaching. My favorite thing in the whole world to do is fitness and nutrition genetic testing, which helps us figure out exactly what your body needs, um, your proteins, your carbs, your fats, your exercise routines, uh, how your body recovers and inflammation. Um, and I just, I think it's the coolest thing ever to be able to see exactly, um, get the owner's manual for your body. Um, so, happy to answer any questions or you're welcome to get in touch with me. Absolutely. Is uh, with fasting, like 14, 16, 20 hours, is that something that would benefit, would help inflammation or maybe have no effect? You're not really taking anything in, you know what I mean? I don't know. Um, my favorite answer, it depends. <laughs> some people, some people do really well with intermittent fasting, um, where they're taking periods of not eating, especially if you have a lot of digestive inflammation. So if you have a lot of digestive symptoms, a lot of people find that allowing their digestive system to rest that extra period of time uh, is beneficial and um, allows that kind of inflammation in the digestive system. It just gives it a rest. You know, if you're not putting food in, you're not digesting, and you give your body a rest. Um, some people find that they really don't feel well with it, and usually that's a sign that, it, that it's not good for you. Um, again, some of that's based on, um, you know, genetically how your body responds to the um, feast famine cycle. Um, some people's bodies completely overreact to not eating. For you know, they think if we've not eaten for you know 14 hours that. We, there must be a famine and we're dying, and their body kind of responds in that way. Um, other people do, do perfectly fine with extended, extended fast. I find for most people, when you get into the super small eating window, so the fasting window is that maybe 14, 16 hours that you're going not eating, the eating window being the time that you are eating, when people decrease that win window to four or less hours, which a lot of people do, a lot of people do 20 hour fast, 22 hour fast, it's very difficult to get the nutrients your body needs um, if you're a fairly active person uh, in that small window, window of time. Okay. I have a question mm -hmm. about the genetic testing. Mm -hmm. Do is that do you go to the clinic and get the test, or do you like bring your 23 and me, or I'm just <laughs> yeah, so we, we, we do not have a genetics lab at our office right. in uh, We partner with a company that uh, has a genetics kit. It's something you order online. I've had people bring it to the office because they're worried that they're not going to do it right, but super, you've done it. Yeah, it's super really easy. Awesome. Like, oh, cool. It's like a super easy, cheap swab. Uh, you put it in an envelope, you mail it away. You get about a 45-page report. Um.